when reading over financial statements, you identified companies you were virtually certain were frauds. What was it in those financial statements that you saw that made you be so certain they were frauds? Well, it, it, it varies just enormously over the years, but uh, uh, there are, uh, we, we can't identify 100% of the frauds or 90% or 80%, but there's certain ones that jump out to you. Just people give themselves away a lot too. I mean, in poker, they talk about tells and Charlie and I have bought a lot of businesses and it's, uh, it's very important when we buy those businesses that we assess the individuals that we're buying from uh, with some degree of accuracy because, you know, they hand us the stock certificate and we hand them a lot of money. And then we count on them to run the business with as much enthusiasm after they have the money uh, as they did before. And so we are assessing people. And we don't think we can assess everyone uh, accurately. We just have to be right about the ones where we make an affirmative decision. And those decisions have not always been perfect, but they've been pretty good. And I would say they probably have gotten a little bit better even as the years has passed. Similarly, in looking at financial statements, uh, for example, in, in the insurance field, we, we've seen some frauds and they're, you can see things being done with loss reserves occasionally. We saw it back in, won't name any names, unlike Charlie. I don't, we'll call them, call them company A's and B's instead of naming names. But you would see companies that, when they were uh, offering stock to the public, you know, the year or two before that, the reserves would go down very suspiciously. And, you know, then, and, uh, or, or even when they were selling them uh, uh, to other insurance companies, uh, uh, they were buying in stock, they might be building the reserves that but there's a, there's a there's a million different ways and I don't claim I know all the ways obviously but I have seen enough situations over the years and I've seen how promoters act uh, and you can you can spot certain people who uh, you know are are one way or another playing games with the numbers uh, they give themselves away but I can't I can't give you a checklist of 40 items or something of the sort that you look for in the, in the balance sheet or the income account or the footnotes. So. If you've got doubts, forget it. You know, basically, and, uh, there's probably some reason you uh, uh, It's interesting, the accounting, they've worked harder and harder and harder at, make, at coming up with disclosures in accounting. And, I'm not sure I find present financial statements more useful or in some cases as useful as I found them 30 or 40 years ago. I don't know. Charlie? Yeah. Well, I, I think the financial statements of big banks are way harder to understand now than they used to be. They just do so many different things and they've got so many footnotes and there's so much gobbledygook that it doesn't they're not my grandfather's banks. Well, we couldn't understand them when we owned them. I mean, we, we, yeah. uh, we bought a company that generally what, they had 23,000 derivative contracts. And Charlie and I could have spent 24 hours a day and had the help of 10 or 20 math PhDs, and we still wouldn't have known what was going on. And uh, uh, it cost us about $400 million to find out. That, uh, and, and that was in a benign market. But nobody can. And I the mean. accountants that certified the balance sheet. Sure. It's a new kind of asset I, I invented a name for. I said, good until reached for. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and you, would, you would actually, the same auditing firm would be auditing two different companies that are on the opposite side of a, a derivative transaction and, and, and attesting to different values uh, to the same contract. It, Charlie found one mistake at Solomon on a derivative contract. What was it, 20 million? On? But, uh, it, no, it was a big contract, and, and both sides reported a large profit blessed by their accountants on the same contract. Kind of like us in Just Swiss for Rig. making it. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's pretty obvious. 
I once was introduced by Warren of all people by accident to a man who wanted to sell us a fire insurance company. And among the first things he said with a thick accent from Eastern Europe, I think. Don't, don't name countries. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I don't remember the country. Good. Good. <laughs> But what he told me was, he says, it's like taking candy from babies, he said. We only write fire insurance on concrete structures that are underwater. And I figured out instantly that it was probably fraudulent. The guy's a crook. I'm a very acute man. Yeah, the guy's a crook. Now, were you, you actually, you had some experience, you know, as a lawyer in the movie industry. In a few places. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, the, when you get into accounting for, well, movies are a good thing, I mean, in terms of, in terms of how fast you write off uh, properties and anything where you've got, got construction in progress or you know, progress payment type things. There's, there's so many ways you can, you can cheat in accounting. Uh, in financial institutions are particularly probably prone to it. it, it uh, and there's been plenty of it in insurance. Uh, a lot of it, they're not being deliberately fraud, fraudulent because they're deluded. In other words, they believe what they're saying. If once people get in a competitive frenzy, things just go out of control. I, w I became the interim chairman of CEO, uh, the, inter the interim CEO of Solomon in 1991. And fortunately, I had testified to both the House and Senate committee before I found this out. Uh, because, and generally speaking, incidentally, Solomon wanted to have conservative accounting. I think that would be a fair statement. And, and in many cases did. But they did come in to me one day and they said, Warren, you probably should know that we have this item I think it was around 180 million or something like that, uh, with a capital base of four billion maybe, but 180 million. And they said, "This is a plug number, and we've been plugging it ever since Fibro merged with, merged with Solomon in 19, I guess, 81 for 10 years. This number moved around every day, and as I remember, Fibro or so, one of them was on a trade date system, that was on a settlement date system." And in 10 years with Arthur Anderson, uh, as their accountant paying a lot of money in auditing fees, uh, they just never figured out how the hell to get the thing to balance. So they just stuck a number in every day. And they literally plugged it for 10 years and I couldn't figure out how to unplug it myself. I mean, it was, it, you almost had to start over. Didn't they do that one time out there? We did that. Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah we, right. We had a discrepancy when we changed accounting systems in our savings and loan, and none of the accountants could fix it. So we just let it run out. Yeah, we let the account. We just let the account run out. Yeah. And, uh, and we, we start over again. We started over, right. <laughs> yeah. Accounting is not quite the science that people and might want to. accounting, you can do things like, like leave when they have trouble with the mail. You know, it piles up and irritates the postal employees. They just throw away a few carloads, and then they're <laughs> everything's flows well, naming smoothly names thereafter. Again, folks. <laughs> Sign them. That happened in some unnamed international company country. <laughs>